let's all stand up to our feet together. Who's glad to be at Rivers Crossing this morning? Come on, let's put those hands together. We're gonna kick off the Christmas season. Pink! 
watching it unfold. And there's good news for the captain, a proclamation for every soul. Cause this liberty is for the broken, an invitation to be made whole. Listen for the free man singing, he's delivered me. Look out for the woman. You've always been a fire, the refiner. Oh, 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 oh. If the altar's where you need us, take me there, take me there. If what you need is just an offering, it's right here. My life is here, and I'll be a living. Sacrifice for you, your fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed, I want to be tried by the fire. Sing y'all, you take whatever you need, Lord. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by the fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. If your glory wants to come.
my hands purify my heart I want to burn for you Jesus only for you and take my life as a sacrifice I want to burn for you Jesus only for you everybody sing my life, Lord God. I give it all, Lord Jesus. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore. Oh! 
prophets cry also one day you'd trade your life for mine and i'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon up together come on sing it out you're all together all together worthy all together wonderful to me you could close your eyes and if you're comfortable Lift your hands. I just want to pray a very simple, short prayer over you. Abba, I pray that this Christmas season, that that would be the posture and the cry and the song of our hearts as individuals and as a church family, here we are to worship. That you would hear our song and that it would be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear, Father, that here we are to worship. That everything else that goes on in this month, the busyness, the craziness, the heartbreak, the excitement, the joy, at the end of every day, we would take a moment to say, God, here I am to worship that everything else would fall into perspective behind that one thing, that we are here to worship the one true King as sons and daughters of you, Father. Thank you, amen. Thank you so very much for coming here this morning. If you could say hi to someone next to you as you grab a seat. My name's Josh, I'm a volunteer here at Rivers Crossing. I've never met you before. Thanks so much for joining us today. If it's your first time ever joining us, a special thanks to you. I know what it's like to check out a church for the very first time. Um, we would like to make that process as easy for you as possible and to let you know that you truly are the reason we do everything we do around here. So as you leave today, the last table on the left is kind of our welcome visitor center. Anyone there, they'd, they'd love to just connect with you, say hi to you, thank you one last time, and then give you a free t-shirt. So if it's your first time here, make sure you stop by that table before you leave today so we can give you that free t-shirt. December and Rivers Crossing means Christmas Conspiracy. And if you're not familiar with Christmas Conspiracy, this is our church-wide program we do every single year in December to give more, spend less, love all, and worship fully. Spend less, give more, love all, worship fully. I love that heart posture in the Christmas season. It just gives me so much peace for me and my family to go into Christmas with that being the focus outside of all the other craziness. So in two weeks on December 19th, we'll take up our Christmas conspiracy offering and that will go to fund two things. One, we go to, it goes to fund new churches and new cities to reach more people for Jesus because that's our mission. And then secondly, it goes to fund Joshua's Place, all for 2022. If you're not familiar with Joshua's Place, it is our food co-op, uh, after school tutoring, weekend meal program in all of our communities. We have five of those now serving students in fa and families in Mason and Kings and Little Miami and Lebanon. And two years ago, we went into Deer Park school districts as just the food co-op in Deer Park. But I'm excited to tell you that next year for Deer Park, they're also getting the weekend meal program for them as well. It, if you don't understand what that means, we believe that no child should go to bed hungry and there are children going to bed hungry in Deer Park. And now you, not the church, you have an opportunity to say, no, not in our school districts, not in our community. We're gonna love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So in all of our communities where we live, these are our neighbors, these are our, our kids' friends that we have an opportunity to impact their lives. 
Joshua's Place was started 13 years ago in a basement just as a food co-op in South Lebanon. And because of your generosity, it continues to grow every year. And this new addition to Deer Park, that alone is an additional $75,000 that has to go into their budget for next year. So we give at Christmas Conspiracy to fund that because we believe in the gospel mission of loving others the same way we love ourselves. And that's the Christmas Conspiracy Challenge. Every dollar you spend on Christmas, every present you buy, every tree you put up, every meal you go to, every ugly sweater you buy, that you match that dollar for dollar and say, we spent this much on Christmas, that's what we're giving away for the Christmas Conspiracy. If there is a, a documentary about adventure, I'm all in. That just, that wanderlust, it just kicks up inside of me and my heart gets drawn to it. And I love the challenge, especially, especially physical challenges. I'm just, I'm all in. My family and I, we watched a documentary just this past weekend called 14 Peaks. And a guy from Nepal, Nims Persia, he decided he was gonna climb the 14 tallest peaks in the world in under seven months. It's been done a few times in history. The first guy that did it, it took him 16 years. The fastest it's ever been done is seven years. And he said, if I survive it, I'm doing it in under seven months. And they were interviewing his family. He's getting a lot of pushback. Everyone's saying, all these experienced climbers are saying, you're, you're gonna die on one of these mountains. This isn't possible. So he named his project, Project Possible, just to push back on that. And said, I'm, I'm going to do this or die trying. And they interviewed his brother at one point and his brother said, I love my brother so much and I don't want him to die. And they showed that video to Nims and Nims watched his brother say that. And then he simply said this, if you wanna do something great, you have to be willing to die. And I love that heart posture when we talk about Christmas conspiracy, because that's the reality. If you wanna do something great, it is going to cost you. And the greater, the, the greater thing that you do, the more it's going to cost you. So we make no hidden agenda about Christmas conspiracy. It's gonna cost you something. You have to spend less on presents. You're gonna have to give more. It's going to cost you something. But if you want to do something great, it's going to cost you something. And maybe you don't think $500, $5,000, for some of you, maybe $50,000 you could give in two weeks of Christmas conspiracy. Maybe you don't think that that's great, but I promise you the kids in your community that last school year spent the entire weekend hungry, that couldn't focus on Monday morning at school because they were just trying to get to lunch so they could get food back in their system, that this coming school year, instead on Friday, they will get a backpack full of healthy food that they can eat over the weekend. I promise you, they think that 50 bucks you squeeze into your, into your budget last minute to get the Christmas conspiracy, I promise you, they think it's great. So that's what Christmas conspiracy is about. It's about us saying, this is the gospel message and we're gonna be a part of it and we're gonna be fully engaged followers of Christ and we're gonna commit to it. So if you, if you wanna commit to that, if you wanna be a part of the Christmas conspiracy, you can go on the website, you can pull your phone out, you can do it right now, you can get inside the app and you can sign up and say, I'm gonna join the, I'm gonna join the conspiracy. I'm doing it this year. So that's my challenge for you. Will you please partner with me and my family and as a church family, if that could be our heart posture this Christmas. And then coming out of that, that'll be in two weeks on the 19th. And then later in the week, we have our Christmas Eve services. Who loves Christmas Eve at Rivers Crossing? If you didn't cheer, you have never been to one because they are awesome services. We have services on the 23rd and 24th. On the 23rd, we have two services right here uh, in the Mason campus at 5 and 7 p.m. And then on the 24th, we have three services here in Mason at 3, 5, and 11, and then one at Deer Park on the 24th, also at 5 p.m. There's child care for preschool and under. Everyone else, all the kids, they can come in here and join uh, our family-friendly candlelight service. And if you're worried your kids won't focus for that, just tell them they get a candle, they get fire at the end, and they'll, they'll pay attention, they'll be all about it. So. Do me a favor and plan to join us at Christmas Eve. Uh, that's one of my greatest joys, not to do that, not to go to the Christmas Eve service with just my family of five, but with my church family, with you guys. So pick a Christmas Eve service and plan to come and engage that. And if you've forgotten, or you're one of the people you've never been here, you've forgotten how great they are, this is a reminder. Let's check out this trailer of Christmas Eve at Rivers Crossing. What's up, Rivers Crossing? How are you guys doing? Those are just a few of the, the scenes from some past Christmases here. I love Christmas at Rivers Crossing. If you've never been, like, 
our venue host said at our campuses to one of our services, uh, then you're missing out. They're amazing and they're amazing for you to invite your friends to. Maybe this is your first time today. I met a first time guest after our first service here in Mason and she just happened to pop in today and she's planning on bringing her family back. Maybe you're one of those first timers, but maybe you've got a lot of friends who need to be here for Christmas. Uh, and uh, we wanna give you a tool to invite them. There's a little pack of invite cards that you can grab on your way out today. We say around here all the time that if you're a follower of Jesus, God has supernaturally and strategically put eight to 15 people in your life that he wants you to share the love of Jesus with. And a very simple way is just to invite them to church. You can put these things everywhere. You can leave them in bathroom stalls. Our staff is very creative of where they put these things. Uh, don't be obnoxious, but get the word out, grab some of these. Uh, they're in packs of five, so you might need to, to get three, four, five, ten packs of these, and let's pack the house out on December the 23rd and 24th, amen? So you can grab these today at both of our campuses. And if you're new, you may not know that we are a church that meets in three locations here in Mason every week at our campus in Deer Park and our online family. So let's welcome online, let's welcome Deer Park. Thank them for being here with us. And uh, if I haven't met you yet, my name's Paul. I'm the lead pastor. I've not been here the last two Sundays um, because my mom passed away. And uh, I just wanna first, before I even start this message, say thank you. Uh, I, I mean this on behalf of my family, my, my personal family, then my, my three older brothers, my dad. We received so many outpourings of love. Our church plants were sending flowers to the funeral. You texted, you Facebooked, you messaged, you sent flowers, you pounded us with food and cards and, and I'm still receiving, um, I'm praying for you. I'm still receiving, we love you. And I just wanna express from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Uh, thank you for loving our family well during this. We love you guys. And uh, my mom uh, thankfully knew Jesus. So, um, you know, if you've never dealt with Alzheimer's or dementia, uh, you, you lose your parent twice. So a year ago, we mourned her, her passing of her mental capacity. And this year we buried her and guess what? She has got her right mind. She is in the presence of God and she is with Jesus right now. So, so thank you. I mean that. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Uh, I got the text for this service, our 1045 here in Mason. Um, three weeks ago, I got the text right before I came up to preach the first service. And I don't remember what I preached. You guys watched it back on video because she was about to pass any minute. She ended up passing a little bit later uh, at 1227 a.m. on that Monday. And uh, that Monday, Pastor Jeff found out he was closing out our Life in Technicolor series and he absolutely crushed it. Pastor Jeff, thank you for stepping in and doing that. I appreciate you so much. And then just a, a quick reminder of Christmas conspiracy. We plant churches because of your generosity. And uh, we've got some in the pipeline I'm really excited to share with you about, but you got to hear from Pastor Stevie Flockhart last week, who is crushing it in Memphis because of your generosity. So uh, I'm thankful that I was able to grieve and be with my family, but I'm really excited to be back. And one of the things that uh, I remember the most about my mom is the day after Thanksgiving, the Christmas tree came out. I don't know, some of you guys, you start decorating in September, you're a little weird, but we love you. Uh, I love Christmas, but that, that was like a ritual. It was the day after Thanksgiving and and our Christmas tree was an artificial tree. How many of you are artificial tree people? Okay, all the real, pe real tree people who are like, you guys are, see, there's a lot of this. This service represents the artificial tree people. And uh, we were artificial because my mom was a clean freak and like a real tree left too much of a mess. So we would bring out the artificial tree and it was in a, a 50 gallon oil drum. It was packed down in there and we would assemble it. And this is back in the day before pre-lit Christmas trees. All you young people have it so easy. You actually had to, you had to put the lights on the tree and then we would decorate it. And my favorite moment was when you would light it. And our tree kind of looked like this. It, it was like an old school Christmas tree. You know, it had the like big bulbs and they're kind of coming back, right? The, the red and the, the green and the white bulbs. But, but I would always, right after we would light the tree, I would go lay on my back and lay underneath the tree, kind of like this. <laughs> and I would lay there for hours and I would just stare into the radiance of the lights. I love Christmas. I don't know about you. How many of you love Christmas? Not everybody loves Christmas. I love it for, for so many reasons. I love it for the food. I love it for the traditions. I love it for the lights. I love it for the decorating. I love it because 
God so willed that I would be born on Christmas Day, and yes, that's true, so it's my birthday. So I, I love Christmas, and, and I love all of the things that surround Christmas, and, and if you're not yet married, you might be one day, or maybe you're dating someone. How many of you know that, that your family's Christmas is different than perhaps your girlfriend or your fiance or your, your future wife's Christmas, right? Everybody has different traditions. They have different food that they eat on Christmas than what you ate. They have different decorations. They have different ways of celebrating. They have different ways of opening presents, right? I'm the baby out of four boys. And uh, at our Christmas, we would go and we would sit down on the couch or usually I'm the baby, so I would be on the floor because there wasn't room for me. And, and, and the, the, the Christmas gifts would be piled up whether it was a small Christmas and there was a couple or a big Christmas and there was a few more, they would be piled up in your spot and you would get your stocking first and then it was a free-for-all. It was like, ready, set, go, gun fires. And there's wrapping paper just flying everywhere and someone might say, oh my gosh, and you'd look for a second and then you'd rip into your next one because you wanted your gift to be better than your big brother's gift. And it was just like total chaos, done, four to six minutes, right? <laughs> and then... And then I asked Farah to marry me uh, in December, and, uh, and then I, I went to her house before our first, uh, b during Christmas before we got married. So my first Christmas is like Christmas Day. I get to her house, beautifully decorated, amazing. So, so some similarities between our families. The Christmas was a big deal in our house, a big deal in her house. And then we got to the time where we opened presents. You know, and I'm expecting like, we got maybe eight, 10 minutes, and then we're moving on to the next thing. And uh, her parents got up to distribute gifts. <laughs> one at a time and everyone sits patiently while that person unwraps the gifts and my mother-in-law is the most exquisite gift wrapper in the world so often you were unwrapping the bows so you could save those for later the paper and I'm like I'm sitting there and you know I'm not in the family yet I mean I'd asked for the hand in marriage and they said yes but I'm not there yet so I'm trying not to visibly react I'm I like but I guarantee you about two and a half hours in my jaw was on the floor going, are we really gonna do this all day and uh it, Anybody know families are different, right? And Christmas points that out. And, and oh, by the way, guess, guess whose family won out? Guess how we open gifts at the Taylor household, my family. <laughs> 25 years and counting. Alex, here's your gift. Ansley, here's your gift. <laughs> one at a time, one at a time. <laughs> but you know what? Um, there's one similarity between our two families, the lights, the Christmas lights, the radiance of Christmas. This series and our Christmas services this year are called A Radiant Christmas, which by the way, when we were brainstorming months ago for this series and for this transformation that you walked into at both of our campuses that you're watching online and you can see, but if you're in the tri-state, you need to come see it in person because it's yeah. amazing. My wife came up with the idea of A Radiant Christmas and I thought it was amazing. And then our teams ran with it and they transformed this facility along with the help of a lot of volunteers and a lot of staff. So let's thank them for this amazing transformation, amen. But it was those lights, they, they, they were the thing that, that was so similar and I still get lost in the radiance of those lights. And speaking of my wife, I remember the day that I saw her in a wedding gown. March the 23rd, 1996, and we were old school, like the groom doesn't see the bride until like the moment that the doors open up and, and there she was in all of her glory and radiance and white gown shining veil over her head. Father-in-law, not so good looking, but I was, <laughs> I, was, I was captured in that moment. And like, it was so strange, like at that exact moment, like some dust or a bug flew in my eye and I got this water that was like coming up in my, no, like I teared up. I teared up and like, and like I'm trying not to like cry, you know, big, big dude. And, and, uh, and, and then like the only time in my life this has ever happened, I can't replicate it, I've tried, but my lips started quivering. Like literally I could feel my, my lips doing this thing like this. And, uh, and, and what was that? It was the radiance of my bride. And you know what, if, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, and some of you aren't yet followers of Christ, 
And that's okay, you're in a, in a safe place. You're in a place where all the lights of Christmas will mean something different after this message today. Because the Christmas light isn't about the lights on the tree. It's about the light in you and me. It's about Jesus Christ. And, and what I experienced looking at my bride, the scriptures describe that followers of Jesus Christ will be radiant because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter five, the apostle Paul is writing and he's talking about relationships, which uh, relationships can get strained around the holidays. And he's specifically talking to a husband and a wife and guys, this is free. This is not a marriage talk today, but, but the context of what Paul is saying, he's telling wives how they're supposed to love their husbands and then husbands how they're supposed to love their wives. So husbands, listen up specifically, but all of you listen up to Ephesians chapter five, verse 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. In other words, dudes, uh, if you're married, you got to be willing to die. Amen. <laughs> you got to be willing to lay down your life for the life of your Bride, and I'm not talking about like, this is free. Somebody needs to hear this. It's the Holy Spirit to this service. Listen carefully. I didn't say this the first service that the Holy Spirit wants someone to hear this. This isn't about physical death, which I would gladly take a bullet, step in front of a train for my bride. Like, like right now. But this is a talking about dying to my selfish needs, my selfish desires. And husbands, if you are ever gonna love your wife like you're commanded to, to love your wife like Christ loved the church, it's willing to die, not just physically, but with all your stubbornness and your insistence upon being right and winning. That was free. <laughs> that was for me as well. But look at verse 27. Husbands love your wives just as, 25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy and to present her to himself as a what? Say it with me. Radiant church. A radiant church. The new Oxford Dictionary defines radiant like this. Not gonna be on the screen, so just listen. Sending out light, shining or glowing brightly of a person or their expression clearly emanating great joy, love, or health of an emotion or quality emanating powerfully from someone or something very intense or conspicuous. Rivers Crossing, Jesus came, died, conquered death, and sent the power of the Holy Spirit so we can be radiant, not just at Christmas, but all the time. So we can emanate the glory of God. We can be radiant. When you look at the Christmas story, like I did this week, as I was reflecting back over all the images of light and radiance and brightness in the Christmas story, I'm like, it's, it's everywhere. Actually, you have to go back to the Old Testament because the Old Testament foreshadows the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. It tells literally the location. There were messianic prophecies, over 600 of them. And 300 got really granular and specific about how, where, to whom, location, timing. And, and 700 years before Jesus is born, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter nine talks about the light that would come into the world. Isaiah nine, chapter two, Isaiah Chapter nine, verse two says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. This morning, Pastor Ran was walking through this passage with our, our worship teams. And, you know, he reminded us as we prepped ourselves to get ready to, to come into the presence of God today, to lead you in worship, to preach the word of God, that in Isaiah's time, that light would come. In our time, the light has come. And it's here right now. And Isaiah goes on a few verses later in verse six, very famous passage about the Messiah, about the birth of Jesus at Christmas. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son 
is given. And some of you are like singing the rest of it right now from Handel's Messiah. And it goes on to say, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. See, Isaiah saw the light that would come through Jesus 700 years before the light ever came in a manger. Then you get into the New Testament and you Maybe you grew up going to a, a church that had a live nativity or you had an outside nativity and then someone would get up and they would read the traditional Christmas story from the book of Luke, which Luke's story is about the, the, the angels and the shepherds and it's, and it's laced with the narrative of Jesus' birth right before he came and then like right as he was born and then like up to 40 days after his, he was born. And in Luke chapter one, Zechariah, who is... Um, the father of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, who would precede him and preach about the coming of the kingdom of God. He kind of, he kind of was the, the hype man for Jesus. He was prepping everyone to get ready. The Messiah is coming. And oh, by the way, I'm not even unworthy to, to untie the laces of his sandals. And, and he, is, he is the Messiah and he is the Lamb of God. And his dad, when he was in the womb, um, spoke about not just his son, but about the Messiah in Luke chapter one, verse 78. Because of God's tender mercy, this is Zachariah, John the Baptist, dad speaking. The morning light from heaven is about to break on us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. How many of you know that we are still in a dark, dark world? But there's a light. There's a light. There's a light that was born in a manger 2,000 years ago. And if you keep going in Luke chapter 2, you get the classic passage of the shepherds and the angel appearing in verse 9. It says, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. You go on a few verses later. Again, just as I'm, I'm looking over this, as I'm studying, as I'm prepping, I'm like light and radiance are all over the Christmas story. It's everywhere that you turn. 40 days after Jesus was born, he was taken to the temple in Jerusalem for Mary to go through a ceremony, a Jewish ceremony of cleansing that women went through after they were, they were, they were pregnant and gave birth, and then also to dedicate Jesus. And there was a man living in Jerusalem at that time who was old. He was elderly. His name was Simeon, and God had spoken to him and made him a promise. He said, you will not die physical death until you see my Messiah. And it kept him going. He just kept hanging on to believe that, that the chosen one was gonna come, the savior of the world that was gonna come, that the light of the world that was gonna come, that the light to all the nations, all these things that had been said about the Messiah in the Old Testament, he had wrapped up in his heart of hope and he waited and he waited until one day, and the scripture says that the Holy Spirit told him to go to the temple. And so Simeon went to the temple and he meets Mary and Joseph there and he takes baby Jesus up in his arms and he says this in Luke 2, 28. He took the child in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. This is so key. He is a light to reveal God to the nations and he is the glory of your people, Israel. See, Jesus is the light. We sing about him at Christmas. I love, I love when the, the, the theme was chosen, Farah had the idea for a Radiant Christmas, the teams ran with it. And, and if you did not download Radiance, our new Christmas EP that came out on Friday, go download it today. We sang a couple songs from it today and, and the team rewrote the lyrics to that classic worship song, Here I Am to Worship, to, to, to really help us this season understand what Jesus Christ did when he stepped out of glory and into a manger. The one who, who spoke creation into existence. You need to understand what the New Testament says about Jesus. <laughs> yes, he came as a baby in a manger, but his preexistent power was with God in creation, and he was the one saying, be. Yeah. 
And it was. That, that's what arrived in the manger. There's so many other songs that we sing. I love that. Download it today at Spotify or Apple Music. <laughs> but, you know, every Christmas, I got an amen from Pastor Ram. <laughs> every Christmas services for Christmas Eve, Eve, the 23rd, 24th, however many days we end up doing services, um, we always close our service with our candle lighting. You saw it in the, in the hype reel earlier. And I love that moment. And we sing Silent Night together. And it's a very famous song, special moment. Candle wax everywhere. Our, you know, scraping candle wax for days. But it's an awesome moment. <laughs> and, um, you know, that song Silent Night is not about the night. It's about the light. It's not about the night, it's about the light. One of the lyrics, there's several in there, says, silent night, holy night, darkness flies and all is light. It goes on to say in another stanza, silent night, holy night, son of God loves pure light. If I sang it, you could sing along with me, but I'll spare you. Radiant beams from thy holy face. Hark the herald angels sing. Love that song. It it also talks about the light of Christ. Hail the heavenly prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen in with healing wings. Matthew's gospel. You get the three magi, the three wise men. And if you've never read the account, they are these Persian wise men and sages who are hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And some old prophecies about the Messiah said that there would be a light in the sky and they come looking for the Messiah. Why? Because the radiance of a star shone over Bethlehem and they showed up and they said, Herod, where is the king? And Herod's like, I'm the king. And Herod didn't know that he really wasn't the king. The king was born in a manger. And then you get to John's gospel. And I love, it's so profound. Many of you probably heard it, um, but, but if you're not familiar with the text, Matthew and Mark tell the story and it's the story we're familiar with. John takes it a little more philosophical and he begins to talk about in language, the, the wisdom of God, the logos of God, the word of God, like everything that God is, his power, his might, his wisdom, his thought is going to come into a person. And he uses language from the book of Genesis And he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Remember in Genesis, the start of everything, he says, in the beginning, you know what the first thing God uttered that we have recorded in the Bible? Let there be light. John says in John chapter one, one through five, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. This is, if if you don't hear anything else, I say, hold on to this. Verse five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. That's Jesus. That's Christmas. That's Bethlehem. That's the manger. Yet for so many, they're walking in darkness at Christmas. For so many, maybe even some of you, maybe even some of you who call yourself a follower of Jesus, and you really are. Like you, you know that you know that you know that you know Jesus, but Christmas is not about light, it's about darkness. It's about something that happened. It's about a family that broke apart. It's about a family that may be divorced and then got remarried and then Christmas isn't fun and family, it's chaos and traveling and how are we gonna see everyone? Maybe it's someone who like me lost a parent or a loved one right around the holiday. And then suddenly your favorite holiday has different significance. And it's, and it's not about light, it's about darkness. I just wanna give you a great reminder today. Nothing, nothing, not your depression, not your breakup, not your pain, not your past, not your current circumstance, not the loss of a job, not the loss of your bonus, not, not the death of a parent, a spouse, a loved one, a child, your mom, your dad, 
Nothing can overcome the light of Jesus Christ if you know him personally. Nothing can overcome the darkness, overcome the light from the darkness. It, it will never, ever overcome the light of Christ. Yet so many of us are trying to get the darkness out in so many different ways instead of turning to Jesus. It, it, it's so easy. You know, if, if it were only like we could sweep it away, wouldn't it be nice if darkness, we could just get a broom out and just sweep the darkness out of our life? Does that work? I don't know. Let's try it. Can we just, let's, let's try it. Let's kill the lights. Let me see. Can I sweep the darkness out of this room? Yeah. I'm sweeping right now. <laughs> I am sweeping right now. My mother would be happy. Well, can I vacuum the darkness out of here? Well, maybe, maybe I can go something a little stronger. Maybe I can blow it out of here. Front row. I, I can't get rid of the darkness until I turn on the light. It's not going anywhere until I turn on the light. But when I turn on the light, where does the darkness go? See, see, darkness has no choice in your life but to flee under the light of Jesus Christ. Darkness goes under your chair. It goes behind those curtains. It's in closets. And it, and it might be right back there in the closet backstage. It may stay hovering around you in your life. But when you bring the light of Christ into every area in your life, it has no choice. It has to flee. That's who Jesus is. Later in his life, when he's not a baby in a manger, but he's a grown man who had been a, a carpenter, apprenticed to his dad, had lived just a, a, yeah, son of God, frustrating his brothers because he was sinless. And, you know, that's kind of hard to beat that, you know. Why can't you be more like Jesus? Yeah, that's tough. <laughs> but when he's 30, he starts his public ministry. And when he starts his public ministry, he starts to preach and teach. He starts to say things like, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. Around here we say extraordinary life. It's available in Christ. He began to heal people, cast out demons, do miracles, turn water into wine. And yet the religious people hated him. And then he gets up and does the, the, the boldest thing that he had done up to this point in his ministry. And in John chapter 8, now, I preached an entire series on the book of John years ago, and we did seven weeks just on the I am statements of Jesus. And before I read this, I need you to understand that when Jesus Christ said this, he was making a claim to be God. To the first century listener, to a Jewish audience, they would immediately, immediately know. That's why the religious people hated him so much. Because God, when he sent Moses to, the, to, to Egypt to deliver the, the, the Israelites from captivity, Moses is freaking out. He's like, I stutter. I can't talk well. Who, what am I going to do? Who do I even say that sent me? Like you and I, you know, burning bush, we're good. But like, what am I going to tell them? And he says, you tell them that I am that I am sent you. And that's where we get the word Yahweh from. Yeah. Or Jehovah may have been translating your old kings or L-O-R-D in all caps when you see that in the Bible. So when Jesus says this statement that he's about to say, he makes seven of them that I am statements. You can go back and listen to those on your own. But in John chapter 8, verse 12, he says, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am, I'm God, but I'm also the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Let that sink in. We, we, we always, aren't we really good at this? Pastors are, Christians are. I am the light of the world. And then we leave out the rest of the statement. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness. Somebody needs to hear that. If you follow Jesus, you will not have to walk in darkness. But so often we still walk in darkness. We don't have to, but we do. You don't have to, but you do. Ephesians chapter 5, we read earlier. 
from Paul talking about the radiant bride of Christ in verse 8. He says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. Another translation there says literally, doesn't say once you were full of darkness. And in the Greek, this is closer to the meaning. It says you were once darkness. So, so some of you, the reason that you're not walking in the light as he is in the light is because you're still in darkness. You know, it's called the good news because there's some bad news. Gospel means good news. The bad news is this. Before I met Jesus Christ, December the 4th, 1993, I just had my 28th spiritual birthday yesterday. I was not always a follower of Jesus. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Cutting into my time. <laughs> Before I laid in a bed in the North Georgia mountains, disturbed, not being able to sleep, tossing and turning, and finally cried out to God, God, would you please change my life? I was darkness. I wasn't in darkness. I was darkness. And so are you apart from Christ. I read a commentary. I wanted just to read it to you about Ephesians 5.8 because I could not have preached it any better, so I'm just going to read it to you word for word. Surprisingly, the readers are not presented simply as having been in the realm of darkness and being now in the sphere of light, although this would have been true enough. It is not their environment or their surroundings in which they and the rest of humanity live that is in view. Rather, they themselves were once darkness, but now they are light in the Lord. Those ruled by the dominion of darkness or of light represent that dominion in their own persons. So when they were converted, it was their lives, not their surroundings that were changed from darkness to light. This radical transformation had taken place in the Lord. He is the one who has made the decisive difference, and it is through their union with him that they have entered a new dominion and become light. We become light. We become light. We become radiant. We'll talk about that next week. Don't miss next week. We become radiant. God, God created us to be a light to the world. And the moment you know Jesus, the moment the light comes into your life. Yet there's a couple of things from those two passages. Jesus' statement he said what in John 12? Throw that back up there. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you have the light that leads to light. If you follow me. Some of you watching online, some of you at Deer Park, you're struggling. Darkness is surrounding you. You're, you're having difficulty and, and you're like, I know that I know. I don't have like the exact date like you, Pastor Paul, but I know that I was saved, I got baptized, and then you stopped. And you don't follow Jesus daily. See, the light is there as you walk with him daily, as you take steps of obedience daily, as you invite him into your circumstances daily. That's when the light of life is in your life. And then the circumstances of the darkness around you don't dictate how you feel and how you act and how you behave because you're walking with Jesus every single day, one step at a time. Anybody have the, like your grandparent, your parent, your mom, your dad was the like the light patrol? Like you left a room and they're like, turn the lights out. You know, like you get up to go across the room, like you know, there's a book, it's like four feet away. And they're like, did you turn the lights out or they're right behind you? It's like my dad could, could just appear. And there would be a, I'm like, dad, I'm going to the bathroom. I'll be right back, turn the lights out. <laughs> that was my dad and still is my dad. I love you, but that's, that's, that's who you are. <laughs> and he's the thermostat guy too. And guess what? Any of you said, I'm not going to be like this. <laughs> guess who's the light Nazi now at the Taylor household? <laughs> it's like, I know it. And I, I'm like, did you turn the lights out? And like the other day, I, uh, well, I, let me rephrase. The other day, Farah said, uh, who turned off the Christmas tree? And you know what my response was? I didn't want the, I don't want those bulbs to burn out. I just want to save those. So it's a pre-lit tree. I want it to last for years. And, and really, what was I doing? 
trying to save a few cents. They're LED bulbs, people. They barely burn and consume energy. (laughs) But, you know, I think in our lives, like, we turn the light and light on and off all the time. It's like, at church, light's on. I love Jesus, following Jesus, hour a week. Walk out to the parking lot, light off. Doing your devotion or quiet time, if you haven't tried that yet, spend some time with God each day, getting his word, read, light on. Go to the office, light off. Got some Christmas parties scheduled, light off. God, are you watching? No cameras there, right? We go to the marketplace. And it's like, we, we want God to bless us. We, we want him to expand our territory. We pray the prayer of Jabez, yet when we walk into the marketplace, we turn the light off and we act like we've never met Jesus. Some of you are students and you walk into your, your schools and God so wants to use you. If you pray just a little prayer right before you went into school, riding on the bus, driving your car, whatever you do, just say, God, help me to be a light today. Light on. Yet the pressure, we just light off, light on, light off, light on, light on. And you wonder why, and I'm speaking to all of us, not students, not marketplace leaders, but homemakers and retirees and husbands and wives and sons and daughters in here. You wonder why the world wonders what Christmas is all about. See, nobody can take the Christ out of Christmas. Christmas is about Jesus, and he came to be the light of the world. Some of you, you're struggling in your marriage or your relationships, your dating relationships, your relationship. Have you ever thought, like, bring Jesus, turn the light, bring Jesus into your marriage, bring Jesus into your relationships, bring Jesus into every area of your life. Why? Because he is the light of the world, and the darkness will not overcome it. Let's pray, God. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that you reach down out of heaven and drew me to yourself. I'm so thankful that you sent your son Jesus. And 2,000 years ago, when it looked like the light went out, when the darkest moment in human history, when Jesus breathed his last, it looked like darkness had won. But three days later, the light came back on. Jesus Christ was resurrected. And God, I am so grateful for that power. And Father, I just pray forth the light and radiance of Jesus Christ this morning over every person here, every person watching online. May the light of Jesus shine in you and through you. May the darkness flee. God, help us. If you're here today and and you are a follower of Jesus, I just want you for a moment to say, Holy Spirit, where do I need to to bring the light of Christ in my life? Where am I struggling? Where am I I turning off the light and not allowing Jesus to be Lord in a certain area? It might be your finances. It might be your relationships. It might be the way you talk or the way you think. And just listen to him, just for a second. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? And whatever he just revealed to you, just submit it to God. Follow Jesus. John goes on to say in 1 John that if you claim to be without sin, you're a liar and the truth's not in you. (laughs) But if you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he talks about walking in the light. So just confess it. Start walking in the light. Receive his love. His radiance beams forth love and grace and mercy to those who seek him. If you're here and you don't know Jesus yet, Maybe you're like I was and you grew up religious, but there was never a change. You never followed Jesus. You had never moved out of darkness and from darkness in your soul into the light. Then 
Today is the day of salvation. Let the light of Christ shine into your heart, your mind, your soul. Cry out to God. Say, God, save me, change me. I receive your son. I believe that you sent him, not just in a manger, but you you sent him to the cross to pay the price for my sin. And I, I just confess that. I believe. I believe that he conquered death. And if that's you, Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Today's the day of salvation. Say yes to Christ. And Father, God, as we just think about the light of the world stepping into darkness, as we think about the lyrics to this great song and we think about the cost as we think about the price, as we think about what it took for that light to shine through your church and through your people, for us to be radiant, Jesus had to step down out of heaven. So this Christmas, God, I ask that you would allow us as a people to reach our city, to invite our friends, to shine the light of Jesus. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen, amen. Would you stand up and let's close in worship. Come on, we sing. Oh, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy. All together wonderful Come on, sing here I am Here I am Here I am to bow down Here I am to say Oh, you're my God You're all together You're all together worthy All together for being here. If you need prayer for anything, if something that was spoken to you this morning or you walked in here this morning, you carried something with you in here this morning and you need prayer, we have a prayer team that have been praying for you all morning and it would be their honor to now pray with you. It's the last room on the left as you leave. It's a glass wall. It says prayer across the front of it. They'll wait there for as long as, you, as, long as they need to, to pray with you this morning. So please don't leave church without getting prayer if you need prayer in your life. Secondly, if you wanna take a step in your life to live more generously, to worship in a new area, and you're not yet a giver of your finances. We challenge you to take that step this morning. Start small if you need to start small, but give something and, and step out into that. If you wanna give this morning, there's three different ways you can give. You can give online, you can give through the app, you can give here in person. So if you want to engage that and become a more fully engaged follower of Christ, you're not already giving, we challenge you to start that process today as small as you can to just get the ball rolling on that. And then thirdly, I feel like 
Paul's message today closed with quite a challenge. And there's also the Christmas conspiracy that we're challenging with you, or challenging you with. And then I'd like to give you one more challenge. If you can't come to church and be challenged, why come to church, right? So Paul already mentioned we're doing the, the giveaway cards, the five cards, five cards. As you leave today, someone's gonna put those in your hands. Don't just leave those in your car and then throw them away in January. Take those things, find people in your life, a coworker, a friend, a student, a stranger in a store, the Holy Spirit says, go invite them. Take, them, take them with you, give those to people. Thousands of people have come to Christ at Rivers Crossing, 750 of them at a Christmas Eve service. So take a step of faith, invite someone to a Christmas Eve service. They can't come to Christ at a Christmas Eve service at Rivers Crossing if you don't invite them to come to Rivers Crossing at Christmas Eve. So take a step, do that, invite someone, your eight, eight, for, invite someone from your eight to 15 to join you at a Christmas Eve service. Thank you so much for coming today. We will see you next week.